Okay, so I want to give you a little bit of a framework over the major different groups of minerals that we can be talking about. Um, and we'll look at representatives. Uh, most of them in lab today. <coughs> there are, I think, somewhere over 4,000 different kinds of minerals that have been identified. Clearly, we are not going to learn them all. Um, that's really not what we need for this course. What, uh, what I want to do in lecture today is introduce you to these basic mineral major groups and talk about some of their different properties and we'll look at a couple dozen of the more common minerals that ones that will be useful for um, looking at different uh, kinds of rock types later and others that have um, you know illustrate different properties of minerals or are important for other reasons So, uh, again, why study minerals? I don't want to spend a lot of time on here, but we looked at that video ahead of time um, at the start of class. This is in that uh, crystal cave in Mexico. And these are, um, oops, these are gypsum crystals, which is a kind of a um, sulfate, calcium sulfate. And you can see here is the actual person compared to the size of the, of the <coughs> mineral crystals. So this would be a really cool place to visit, but uh, not a lot of people get down into this cave. So clearly, minerals are important economically. The same kind of uh, mineral that is in this, um, these structures here are um, the, the minerals that are responsible for sheetrock. So we have uh, a lot of economically important minerals. They're important for building materials, for different kinds of industrial processes, for manufacturing, um, you know, glass making, all sorts of, of practical reasons. And then, of course, um, Minerals give us a view into what's going on into some of these geological systems. So we have a more kind of academic interest in understanding different kinds of minerals. So again, we already talked about this, naturally occurring, inorganic, crystal structure, definite chemical composition, ice, water ice is a mineral, liquid water is not, um, obsidian glass is not a mineral, um, sulfur, malachite, amethyst, uh, biotite, all these other things we're looking at today will be minerals. For minerals, um, minerals will have this repeating structure and you can think of you know, basic building blocks that go into the different kinds of minerals. So. Um, Gypsum will have a certain kind of repeating structure in the mineral. Fluorite will have a different kind of repeating structure, magnetite, garnet, and so forth. So uh, based on these repeating structures, the orientation of those structures, the atoms that are involved, the kinds of, uh, of bonds, ionic, covalent, hydrogen, Van der Waals, you know, other kinds of metallic binding. Um, those building blocks will basically determine the properties of the mineral. And, you know, if, if we were really wanting to look at these, we do things like X-ray diffraction studies where we take a pure crystal of the mineral and we would um, shoot X-rays through it, see how those X-rays bounce off, and use that information to figure out what atoms, how the atoms are arranged in space in relationship to one another and be able to, at uh, a very fine detail, determine the difference in structure between magnetite on the one hand and garnet on the other. <coughs> 
this idea of polymorphism just reinforces that. So diamond and graphite are both pure carbon, but their properties are quite different because the um, arrangement of the atoms in the crystal lattice for the mineral are different. Here we've got this structure that is just a huge mass of three-dimensionally linked covalent strong carbon-carbon bonds, which is why diamond is such a uh, hard um, substance. Here in graphite, we have the covalent bonds between the carbons are mainly confined to these flat sheets. The, um, the sheets themselves are tied together with much weaker forces and therefore the sheets tend to be able to slide across one another, leads you, give, gives you a much uh, softer um, material. Okay. So, uh, don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we can have minerals forming in lots of different ways. So, uh, we will be looking at minerals in rocks a lot. Uh, rocks that have solidified from a melt. And so, part uh, one way that we're forming minerals is through crystallization. But we can also get minerals from precipitation. Here's an example of salt beds that have precipitated out of a salty um, body of water. Can anyone tell what's going on here? Is that a hydrothermal vent? It is a hydrothermal vent and there is material precipitating, obviously not out of a water here in this case. The material is precipitating out of the air. And what is all this yellowish stuff? Sulfur. Sulfur. Okay, so you've got high sulfur content fumes coming out of this hole in the ground, and um, as the hot air hits the colder uh, environment, the sulfur precipitates, falls down and builds up on the around. Okay. We'll talk a lot more uh, in a couple of weeks when we talk about metamorphic rocks, about how metamorphic processes can alter and create new minerals. And then there's also um, a process where living organisms can lay down mineral structures. Many organisms uh, create inorganic structures that have a defined content and a repeating mineral structure, and therefore the minerals are being actually produced by the critters. Whether it's, um, you know, the uh, White Cliffs of Dover, which are basically the action of, of marine organisms, or the teeth in your mouth are essentially inorganic minerals that are laid down by a living organism. And, uh, you know, if uh, I went off and died somewhere and decayed, then, um, you know, the bones and the uh, teeth in particular would have all of these uh, mineral structures that would be then out in the environment. Okay. So here's an, uh, an important figure. This shows uh, what we have to work with. Uh, if you look at a little bit of graph interpretation here, we've got um, essentially two sets of bar graphs. This bar graph in the back with the green bars represents the composition of different materials uh, if you take the Earth as a whole. And if you take the Earth as a whole, what is the most common um, element by percent weight of the Earth? Well, it's whatever this highest bar is, right? So that's iron. Okay. So if you look at the Earth as a whole, iron is the 
uh, greatest proportion by weight. And then this bar comes in next and it's oxygen. Um, and then uh, down here, silicon and so forth. And uh, magnesium. Where is most of that iron though? I mean, we'll talk about this when we talk about the interior of the Earth. Most of the iron is down in the core. Um, and so if you look at the crust, the upper layer of the Earth, here are the abundances of uh, elements. And which are the two most abundant elements in the crust? Oxygen and silicon. And when you put those together, what do you get? So we'll see silicates are going to be the, the most important uh, mineral class that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, okay, so I mean, the main point from this slide, I, we won't go into the details, uh, but the main point on this slide is just that uh, we can uh, identify different varieties of minerals and we can identify uh, different minerals that seem to group together and um, and those classes are what we want to focus on in the in the talk today um, within these classes there are going to be lots of different kinds of mineral species. So within the oxides as a class, there are lots of different kinds of oxides. Each of those could be called a mineral species. Um, and uh, oftentimes, um, you have the same kinds of environmental conditions that would give rise to one kind of Halide, in this case, uh, would also give rise to another kind of halide. So oftentimes you will see um, mineral species of a class uh, being found together in the same kinds of environments. Okay, so for our purposes, we'll keep it simple and we'll say that there are two, four, six, eight main uh, groups of minerals that uh, you, know, you need to be familiar with. Oxides basically uh, have minerals where some cation, whether it's iron or aluminum or Hydrogen, in this case, are combined with um, oxygen. So here, uh, oxygen would be present as uh, um, O minus 2. And in this case, we're talking about ferric iron, which is Fe plus 3. So two of these positive 3 iron uh, cations can bind together with three of the oxygen anions because they're minus two. So we got minus six and plus six and it all balances out. Sulfides have uh, basically sulfur as the uh, anion. Sulfates have sulfate as the anion. Halides have different kinds of Halogen class uh, uh, anions, fluoride, chloride, bromide, um, carbonates, phosphates, carbonates as the anions, phosphates as the anions, or silicates as the anions. So essentially all of these mineral groups are pretty much defined by having a common uh, and iron. So if you've got, um, you know, sulfate compounds, it really doesn't matter that much it, whether it's 
calcium or magnesium or sodium or barium, which is the cation. They all um, act as sulfate kinds of minerals. And, um, you know, the, I guess the take home point there, there is that the anion, the, cation, the anion is really the one that's driving the, the bus here and determining what the properties of the minerals are. Then we have what are called native minerals, which are pure elements. Uh, gold, diamond, graphite, sulfur, copper, um, a variety of others um, that we'll look at later. Um, these are minerals as well. Gold is a mineral because it is naturally occurring, it's inorganic, has a defined composition. And if you look at pure gold, it's got a you know, defined repeating structure. Therefore, it, it classifies as a mineral. What is that crystal shape? Well, it would basically be a metallic binding. It would be a sea uh, of uh, electrons in which there are gold um, atoms with a regular spacing. Um, because of the metallic binding, Things like copper and gold are um, malleable, and so you can take a hunk of uh, gold and pound it into a flat sheet or extrude it out into a wire, like a, or a copper wire, or aluminum wire. Um, basically, those native minerals, the metallic native minerals, all have that kind of malleable um, property. Okay, so I just want to run through uh, most of these groups very quickly, and we will spend most of our time talking about the silicates because they are the most important one. Oxides are basically some metal with uh, oxygen, and therefore you can imagine that um, most many of these are important metal ores. So magnetite, hematite, excellent sources of uh, iron, and, um, you know, I came out here from, um, from Minnesota, and um, in the iron range of Minnesota, it's so-called because a lot of important iron ores um, have been um, excavated from that area over the last century. It was very important for early, you know, commercial in industrial development of the United States. Um, corundum, uh, aluminum oxide, would be a source of aluminum, but it's not the uh, most... Uh, bauxite uh, ore would be um, a more important uh, source of aluminum. Sulfides, again, a metal with sulfur, and these are also important uh, metal ores. So galena, which we have down in the lab, uh, is basically lead sulfide, and uh, it's an important source of uh, lead if you are um, you know, extracting lead. Uh, cinnabar, source of mercury. Um, chalcopyrite is copper um, iron sulfide. It's a good copper ore. Pyrite, fool's gold, it is not gold. Um, iron uh, sulfide. Sulfates, generally speaking, these are precipitated. So we talked about gypsum a lot already. Uh, calcium sulfate. Um, BA is barium. Uh, we talked about it being an important uh, industrial material, sheetrock and so forth, sheetrock, plaster Paris. Uh, halides. These are essentially what we would think of as salts, most likely, although te technically a lot of the other things are salts and anion and anion. <coughs> But table salt would be sodium chloride, 
and you can actually go places where you mine table salt because you have halite deposits, um, potassium chloride, a good source of uh, for fertilizer, so forth. Um, again, sulfates and halides generally from uh, precipitation of salts. Uh, carbonates as well. Oftentimes, uh, oh, shoot, I don't want to do that. What, Corey? Okay, so I probably just screwed up the recording there. Oh well. Um, phosphates are um, again defined by the phosphate uh, anion. Um, probably less of an important category compared to some of these others, but um, probably the most important practical use for phosphate minerals is in the production of fertilizer. So under certain soil conditions for certain plants, uh, you can be phosphate limited, or if nothing else you want, a fertilizer that's got a balance between you know, a source of, uh, of um, nitrogen and phosphorus. And so um, there is mining of uh, phosphate ores uh, to support the, uh, the fertilizer industry. This appetite here, which is not appetite, but is spelled appetite, um, is a principal mineral that uh, is found in your teeth. So your body's producing appetite when you when you grow your grew your teeth. And then of course there are the silicates, which are uh, the big group that we need to be aware of. Again, they the, this group as a whole has different subgroups based on how the silicate tetrahedra are arranged in the mineral. Everything from isolated tetrahedra that we find in things like olivine and garnets to pairs and chain uh, rings, single chain, uh, things like pyroxene, uh, double chain, We'll see amphiboles in um, um, you know, some of the igneous rocks that we're looking at. Sheets of, um, of um, tetrahedra, micas. We'll look at some micas today. But clay minerals and, and serpentine are important uh, soil components that are made up of these sheet-like uh, silicates. Um, and then, of course, there is the three-dimensional joining together of the uh, tetrahedra to form quartz and related materials. Okay. So the ratio of, of silicon to oxygen in the isolated tetrahedron is what? How many oxygen per silicon? Okay, so here we have Si to 4O. And we worked through this earlier for the single chain. What's the ratio? Uh, 4 to 1 is for the isolated tetrahedron. So if we're looking at the chains, if you have a long enough chain, basically each Tetrahedron is sharing an oxygen, and so this reduces the ratio down to three oxygens per one silicon. Quartz is down at the furthest end of that ratio. It's two oxygen for every silicon. That should be consistent here. So the sheets are going to be somewhere between two to three oxygens per silicon. And these structures here are going to be between three and four oxygens per silicon. So increasing 
um, reduction in, in oxygen per silicon as we go to these more and more lar larger and more complicated structures. And then to form the silicates, uh, we basically would have the, these tetrahedral structures associated with some kind of some of course um, some mix of cations that would be characteristic of the different minerals. Uh, so we've got everything from well, we'll, we'll look at these more uh, later. But um, again, of the 4,000 species of minerals, over 800 of them are silicates, silicate minerals. 90% of the Earth's crust, so clearly an important uh, component of uh, the mineral universe. Um, those silicate minerals that have um, iron and magnesium are going to be, tend to be heavier than those that don't, that have more uh, potassium and calcium and other um, lighter anion, uh, cations. And so there's a kind of a basic differentiation between uh, the mafic materials and felsic. Um, the presence of these cations, generally speaking, will make the mineral and the corresponding rocks made out of those minerals darker. Um, so, biotite mica, which we'll look at in the lab today, as a mafic sheet uh, silicate structure versus muscovite mica, which is uh, more felsic. So quartz, feldspar, muscovite, mica, lighter in color, lighter in specific gravity. The darker minerals, the darker silicate minerals also tend to be heavier in specific activity. Okay, so clearly feldspar, uh, very important. We'll look at a couple of different kinds of feldspars today. We'll look at potassium feldspar, which by and large, uh, appears somewhat pinkish, although that can vary a bit, and not have uh, you know different striations along the side, as opposed to the plagioclast feldspars, which are more sodium and uh, well, more sodium uh, aluminum silicate uh, minerals. Uh, feldspars important in components of granite and other uh, igneous rocks, and we'll see feldspars uh, in in rock samples out in the field and so forth. And as mentioned here, the most common min mineral in the crust. Uh, here we have uh, mica. Mica is a sheet silicate. And uh, as you'll see down in the lab, it's got a very distinctive cleavage. Uh, comes off part in sheets, representing the underlying uh, mineral structure. Muscovite is felsic because it's um, you know, potassium aluminum um, silicate. <coughs> Biotite also has a very similar kind of mineral structure, also has a very similar kind of cleavage, but you can see it's much darker, and it is uh, the mafic version full of magnesium and iron. Uh, here are some more mafic silicates. Um, olivine, we'll take a look at olivine and pyroxene, and uh, the tray of hornblende is basically affable. These are all, again, magnesium, uh, iron, 
uh, silicates of different uh, compositions. Serpentine, again, uh, will flake off in sheets and fibers relating to the, uh, these silicate structures and how they can fold up or roll up into these fibers that come off. Uh, mafic, because of the magnesium. Um, we have serpentine down in the lab, but I didn't put it out for today, so you don't have to worry about, uh, about looking at it today. And then um, garnets. These um, have a wide range of, uh, of compositions in terms of the cations. Um, they are single tetrahedra, as we looked about uh, at in the earlier diagrams. And so because you've got that matrix of individual silicate tetrahedra, with spaces in between, you can fill those spaces with lots of different um, metal cations. Could be iron, could be magnesium, could be calcium, could be chromium, it could be aluminum. And depending on which ones are in that matrix, you're going to get garnets a different color and um, primarily color. We will see garnets. Um, when uh, we're looking at some of the metamorphic rocks, when you take various kinds of parent rock and cook them, uh, cook that rock under pressure and temperature, one of the new minerals that comes out of that metamorphizing process is oftentimes garnets. And at the uh, Stone Church site in particular, um, there are lots of, you can see lots of little garnets in the uh, mica schist that we'll be going, um, going over. I'm to, what, I'm to take Yeah. Uh, and then the last category here, native minerals. There are really only a handful that are important um, in the crust. So we can find iron as a native mineral as opposed to like an iron oxide ore. Uh, what forms do we find carbon as a native mineral in the, in the crust? There are two primary ones. Pure carbon. If you find pure carbon out in the, out in the wild, what's it going to be? You're either going to be rich or you're not going to be rich. It's going to be diamond. Uh, and coal is more of a, uh, of a rock, but uh, we can find carbon as a native mineral in graphite. And I've got graphite out downstairs. I don't have a tray of diamonds out downstairs. Um, sulfur, as we talked about, we can find that as a native mineral deposit. Um, arsenic, bismuth, gold, silver, copper, platinum. Uh, I mean, these are all kind of together here in this part of the periodic table. You might imagine that they would have similar kinds of, of chemical properties and... Um, you know, these are all essentially can show up as ductile metals. So here's, here's what native copper looks like. Um, you know, native copper deposits are very important in um, economic development in different areas. So um, many, um, many of the Native American tribes uh, had access to native copper deposits and had basically a, a copper culture. Um, you can combine copper with tin to produce, um, no, geez, it's blanking, but, uh, you know, copper was an important precursor of the Iron Age in many cultures, and, uh, because it's easier to find in, in pure 
uh, native mineral, it's easier to smelt, and it's, uh, it's how cultures get started with metallurgy, and then later they move on to iron and can produce much more durable materials, metals, than, than what's available with uh, copper. And of course, uh, you know, gold is, has a long history with people, which we don't need to go into.